snow. Come on, where is it? Dave, it's your Idaho Central app here. Any chance you're missing a debit card? Let's get that taken care of for you. With ICCU's card control, you can turn any card off with the tap of your finger. You got it. And back on again. Ow, 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 ow. The closest Idaho Central Credit Union branch is in your pocket. Ooh, the gym. Mold stomping grounds. <laughs> Hank Patterson, fly fishing guide. Riley Smith, tight end. Yeah, I appreciate that. Hey, you wouldn't happen to be the kicker. No, tight end. Again, thank you. I'm looking for a kicker for Lithia Ford's fall kickoff sale. But you're not the kicker. No. Yeah. Now nah, the kicker's probably taller. In a lot better shape. So, okay. What uh, position do you play? Tight end. Squats. Yeah. Try it sometime. RowPaint.com, the official paint and coatings company of Boise State Athletics, is going all in this season with an all-star lineup. First up, he led the Broncos to three conference championships and 10 20-win seasons. It's Coach Leon Rice. Next, he's the founder and CEO of RowPaint.com. He played a little basketball in high school on the driveway with his mom. It's Andy Rowe. Oh, no. Want to just paint my house? Now that I can do. When I want Boise State to win, I trust Coach Rice to lead the Broncos to victory. And when I want the best painting and garage floor coating, I trust RowPaint.com to get that job done right. This is Bronco Nation News Live. The best interviews, the most informed opinions, the latest breaking news, all from the top Boise State insiders. Today's broadcast is coming from the Cutwater Spirits Can Cocktail Studios. Check out one of their more than 30 flavors of pre-mixed premium cocktails at your local gas station or grocery store. Cutwater Can Cocktails is perfect for your next game day tailgate party. Now, here's four-time NSMA Idaho Sports Writer of the Year, B.J. Rains, with another edition of Bronco Nation News Live. Hey, greetings, Boise State fans. Happy Tuesday to you here at BroncoNationNews.com, Bronco Nation News Live. We're streaming on YouTube, Facebook, X, all those uh, various spots to make sure you're following all of our social media channels. Uh, starting a couple minutes early today, Jay, we got practice going on. Um, I was actually ready to bundle up and be out on the blue today, but it sounds like it's inside today. Uh, so uh, even though it's a nice day outside, they're going to practice inside um, and uh, they're getting ready for uh, scrimmage number two on Saturday. We got plenty to discuss uh, from scrimmage one. Uh, you and I were both there to talk to Spencer Danielson after the scrimmage. Um, so a lot going on on the football world. We got the uh, final four wrapped up now, and uh, Boise State already appearing in a couple uh, top 25 lists for, for next season already, even though we don't know what half the roster is going to look like. But mm -hmm. uh, overall, it's another Tuesday here in uh, Boise State land at Bronco Nation News. How we doing, Jay? Yeah, pretty good. Uh, man, what a what a run by UConn, by the way. Like one of the more dominant runs that um, I don't I don't even know if UConn's getting the credit they deserve yet because they absolutely basically obliterated everyone in their path to going back to back. And uh, I really do think it's even it's even more impressive in this era, BJ, because um, you know whether you are a good player or a good team. Um, the transfer portal, NIL, all that stuff, you know, can can really jeopardize or threaten the integrity of your roster. And in an era where, you know, everybody's kind of learning on the fly here and, and trying to discover the best the best method or best tactics to keep your roster intact or collect your roster, UConn just went back to back. I mean, I, I just think it's a a really, really impressive feat by uh by UConn. 
Yeah, I was one of the ones thinking that six and a half was too many points. Uh, I was on the Purdue side there uh, stupidly. Uh, I looked at the Ken Palm number at three and thought, hey, uh, six and a half, there's just too much value here with a team that's been one of the top two teams pretty much all year long. But uh, UConn showing, uh, again, uh, why they, in the last two tournaments, winning every game by 13 points. I mean, just just an insane, insane run here for UConn. And they were clearly the best team in the country yet again. But I will remind you, Jay, they did have three losses this year. And, of course, one of them came to my Kansas Jayhawks. Oh, goodness. Uh, I, I will say this. Um, I thought that UConn was going to win it the whole time. I probably would have picked them to cover. Um, but Johnny Mallory, our, our good friend, Johnny Ballgame, called me last night to talk about the game. And um, I knew that UConn was on a dominant run. I didn't know that they had covered in all 11 uh, or in their last 11 NCAA tournament games. I knew that they're all blowout wins. I didn't realize they had covered 11 for 11, now 12 for 12. That's one of those things where you see that stat, though, and you're like, oh, man, it's got to end at some point in time. Like, you're not only winning 12 straight in the NCAA tournament, but you're covering 12 straight in the NCAA tournament. So um, I still probably would have rolled with UConn, not going to lie there, BJ. But I, that, that was like the one thing that he told me where I was like, oh, man, it's got to end at some point in time. And not not just winning, but just like, but but covering, too. You got your phone close by? Yes. What time did John Mallory call you? uh initially 601 but i was having dinner so i had to call him back (laughs) i was i don't want to put his number on here i wonder if i can do this without showing his number i was wanting to know if i could see what time but if you can see right there 601 601, this call from john mallory so i was trying to see if he called you first or me obviously he was driving home after you were doing his show yesterday i had uh baseball never know but uh good old johnny calling uh and then he sent me a text. You like UConn question mark? And I actually wrote back Purdue. So I'm I'm sorry, Johnny Ballgame, if I cost you some money. But that's what he locked, said he liked no, UConn. No, he was he was on UConn. That's what locked it in. I think he said he texted you to see which way he should go, and he just went the opposite. That's usually what is the smart way to win money. Do it the opposite. <laughs> the last month has certainly been the. As I said, when we were in Vegas, uh, the last day we were there that Saturday, waiting all day for our 8 p.m. flight at the conference tournament. I had a nice little parlay going where all I needed was Purdue to finish it off. Uh, against Wisconsin in the Big Ten semifinals, and it would have been a, you know, very significant parlay that really changed my trip. And then, sure enough, at the end of not only regulation but the end of overtime, Wisconsin had like two shots in the last second or two of each of oh, regulation and yeah. overtime, uh, and, and won the game. And uh, that pretty much has started a nice downward spiral the last month. That I'm now going to be raising the uh, entry for Bronco Nation News to $170, <laughs> not 70. Uh, but uh, so I, I really. Didn't want to root for Purdue after that. I'm still kind of ticked about that last month, uh, not being able to defend with two seconds left. The guy yeah. inbounds the ball and drives in two and a half seconds and lays it in, and then that tied it to go to overtime. Then something helped, and I forget, a shot at the very end of overtime when they were Purdue was up one or something. So I didn't want to root for him, but I also didn't want to see back-to-back. But no denying UConn, man. Just, uh, Dude, six titles in the last 25 years. That's Since 1999, they've won six. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. That's, that's two that's, more than uh, anybody else. That's as many as Duke and North Carolina combined. So I'll ask you this, BJ. Are they a blue blood? I mean, you probably have to throw them in there now. I mean, I probably. They have I as mean, many national titles. Don't they? Uh, as Duke, it, it, all the time as Duke. I saw, or your, tweet, I saw your tweet, too, in terms of the last 25 years and all that. Uh, um, that, that makes I don't sense. know where they rank all time. But, yeah, they, they probably need to be thrown in. I mean, I think when you think blue blood, you think more of, like, the history in terms of when it started and all-time wins think. and stuff like that. So it's blue a, blood, I think, yeah. is – if I'm going to say no, it's not, like, a disrespectful thing to UConn. Um, if you just go to, like, right now, the premier programs are certainly one of those. But I think the blue blood technically is just – means more about longevity and stuff. But, I mean, right. you look at the last 25 years since Jim Calhoun got there and what they've done, there's no denying they're – right there if not the top uh team in the country of late no yeah problem, no it, I, I do think of that i think you know when it comes to the blue blood it's more of the past than just the the present yeah right? i'm thinking like, like john wood and like you wouldn't yeah. say ucla right now has done anything the last several years to, to to be a top team but i would still probably call them a blue blood just because yeah. of their history in the past and stuff like that yeah certainly not because of what they've done recently i, I agree with you on that one I don't, I don't, they don't have one in the last 20 you know uconn's won six they haven't won any in the last you know 25 years you let Scott Garson go and see what happens. Exactly. Boom. <laughs> um, but, you know, as, as long as we're talking about hoops, man, really quick, you know, the, the, just kind of looking at this thing forward, 
you look at what Boise State has the potential to bring back, and you kind of look around the rest of the Mountain West real quick, VJ, and once again, Boise State's going to be right in the thick of a Mountain West Conference Championship next year if this goes how we expect the offseason to go, where target that, that you know, a, a distributor, a, you know, point guard type, um, see if, you know, see what happens with Buzo. While I do probably expect him to come back, I also expect him to exhaust every possibility and see if this is the time for him to go out. Because I, I will say this about him, like, he he would come back for his COVID year, right? Like, so he's already kind of completed his collegiate eligibility. It would be that COVID, that extra year. So sometimes, you know, four or five years is a lot of time for people in college. Other people will rock it a seventh year, you know, just because they want to play college ball. So well, we'll, we'll see how that kind of turns out. If you looked at John Rothstein's uh, preseason top 40 for next year, he's got Cam Martin coming back for an eighth year. He had him listed on the bench. Oh, uh, no way. He, he had uh, Jace Whiting listed as a starting uh, number two guard. Uh, I believe he also had Kobe Young on the bench. So they're going to have a loaded, loaded roster next season, according to John Rothstein. Yep. Oh, also, never heard of this guy. Uh, Andrew Martin, also he had listed on the bench. So um, um, must be a heck of an incoming uh, transfer or freshman that I haven't heard yet about. And somewhere Andrew Meadow was nowhere to be found, so he must be leaving. I didn't know about that either. He really had all those – like, when did he release this? It was uh, like 10 minutes ago. I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of work to try to, at this point, project starting lineups for all these teams with the transfer portal, project a, a, a lineup. I get it. Uh, but literally had like five things wrong with Boise State's roster. But he had him pick 33rd, so I guess that's a little bit of respect. Hey, going take in. it. All right. Once he finds out Cam Martin's gone, though, that might take him out of the top 40. I don't know. Mm. Hey, that would be a great spot for Boise State to begin. Um, I, I do think that they the will. The 68 had him at number 22, I believe, or 21 I, in their I, preseason. I think it was 21, and I saw that. Um, that you know that that may be a little generous there. I don't know, but like at the same time, if if Buzo comes back and and they really do believe that they can go out and get a nice complimentary piece to join the starting five, uh, they're they'll have as talented as any starting five in the Mountain West. I mean, um, I really believe that. I, I don't I don't know who. Yeah, I, we still got to get through the transfer portal and recruiting and all that stuff. But I mean, you look at San Diego State, uh, Nevada, like these are some rosters that they're going to have some serious work to do this offseason to where Boise State is more just kind of complimenting nope. what they bring back and Tyson Dagenhart and Omar Stanley and hopefully Chibuzo Abo and and uh, Andrew Meadow and Roddy Anderson. I mean, th they have a really, really nice roster already in place going into next year. They're just complimenting it, not rebuilding it. I retweeted the field of 68 and I was not trying to take a dig at any other Mountain West fan base, which but right away, every fan base just jumps on you and starts defending their team and saying how clueless mm -hmm. I am. I was merely trying to, to make a comment about Boise State. And I when I retweeted the field of 68, I said Boise State, which should bring back the top trio uh, in the Mountain West this season. Uh, and I said, and maybe maybe on the West Coast, and I know Gonzaga is going to have something to say about that, but I just meant you know, I said maybe, but I also just think in terms of the teams out here, there's not going to be a lot of teams out there that'll have a, a trio that Boise State has. Um, mm -hmm. But right away, some New Mexico fans jumped on me and ripped on me. So I guess I ask you objectively, um, and I think it is probably fairly close, but yeah. Donovan Dent, JT Toppin, and Nelly Jr. Joseph, or Omar Stanley, Tyson Dagenhart, Shabuzo Abo. I mean, I just, I mean, I just, you could just simply look at points per game last year and say that you would you know, give the edge to Boise State. So if you wanted to just yeah. go on stats, I get it that, uh, you know, you'll see some improvement from, from Dent. And I know Toppin had a great freshman year, Joseph as well. Um, they have two big guys. So I don't know if like a three on three contest is fair with that. But I mean, you obviously have uh, Omar Stanley and, 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 and I don't know if that's a good way to say it, but if you played a three on three game with Tyson, Omar and Buzo against those three, I guess Dent would have a little more edge at the guard spot. But overall, what, yeah. what, am I crazy to say Boise State's trio is better than that or? I, I feel like Boise State would probably have a bit of the edge in that matchup. Donovan Dent's fantastic. I mean, he's he's insanely good. Uh, and those bigs that you mentioned had great, you know, beginnings of their careers as Lobos. Um, so I, I think the great thing about it is, is that you can have that conversation. It shows that the Mountain West is not just going to fall off next year. New Mexico is going to be great. Boise State should be great. And, you know, I, it's funny when you when you cover a team, BJ, you kind of know more about that team. Right. I mean, it's kind of probably a given. But you even look at that that trio you named and it's like, you know, Chibuzo Wabo made made a, a nice jump 
uh, you know, from his like, junior year to his senior year, still has his COVID year. If he can do that again, dude could average 15, 16 a game next year. I, I, I mean, like, I think that's probably the realistic, realistic expectation going into that thing. Um, you look at, you know, Omar played, you know, with an injury most of the season and Tyson had his broken nose that, you know, just kind of, it's really funny. That was one of the things we overlooked. Like you can't imagine that, like just didn't, you know, went away. Right. Like, it, he probably had trouble breathing and things like that. So, um, you know, just knowing that even that trio, like I, I expect them to be better than they were this year, and yeah. and they were already really, really good this year, right? So we'll we'll kind of we'll kind of see how that goes. But I, I I just I don't know who could argue that that that's not just an, an elite group to bring back. I mean, we'll see how it plays out. But you could you could make a case, and it won't happen. But you could make a case. That all three of those guys, Degenhart, Abo, and Stanley, could be first team preseason. Um, a lot yeah. of, I mean, I, I think that a lot of times they don't like doing that. They'll try to spread right. it around, get five guys from five different teams or whatever. One thing Steve Alford told me at, at basketball media days last year: Steve Alford would like to see the preseason team extended. Why, why do you have to just have? Why do you only honor five guys? He mm-hmm. said, "Get more." Um, you know, postseason's kind of, different, but in yeah. terms of the preseason, why not just put ten guys on the preseason yeah. All Mountain West team? Why do you have to call it first team? Um, he thinks it's more publicity for the league, more guy, more individual players get recognition. Why stop at five? So we'll see if there's any push for that. Yeah. But if you were to go to ten, I certainly think those are three of the top ten players in the league. I've I've kind of felt the same thing, and I'm actually okay with even having you know a, a first team and a second team preseason. And I thought almost thought the same thing about football too, for that matter, BJ. I mean, there are years where you know the the conference might be loaded at wide receiver, and you can only pick two. Like, I mean, that's that's, that's ridiculous. So. Yeah. Um, even at running back, you know, that was last year. Like they had some great running backs coming back in the league, and you're like, man, I can only pick two of these guys. Like more than two deserve to be honored. Then you get down, and I'm like, oh my god, please don't make us pick, you know, a first and second team for offensive line. No offense, big <laughs> big guys, but that it's already a, a tough task to pick I'd one be of fine those. Just let the coaches pick the O line. I'm fine with that. Honestly, that that would. That should probably be the case because it. Ninety nine point nine percent of reporters, when we vote for the O line, we're either looking at the preseason or we're looking mm-hmm. at Phil Steele or we're uh, talking to somebody else. Like no actual media member is going, yeah. "Oh, I really liked that right guard from Air Force when they played Boise State." Like, no, you're not doing that. Yeah, my usually what I do with that is I go back and I look at the the last you know the the postseason awards from from last year, who's first, second, third team honorable mention. Then that kind of like condenses the list and you find out who's coming back. Has anyone significantly transferred in? Um, I usually have, you know, good knowledge, like, you know, can, the teams we cover, right, BJ? So like you yeah. have a good idea, man, people might not be talking about Cage Casey, but I know that dude is a dude. And so he's going to be on my first team, right? And then after all of that, you're right. I'm like, well, what are, what's everybody else? What are the national people saying? Because I will say this, like, you will look at a field steal. He at least talks to, you know, every coach in the country. So he's got a, like a little gauge there. And sometimes I look at his and I'm like, no, nah, that's not right. Like Ashton Gentry's yeah. absolutely a first team or, la- you know, whatever it might be last year preseason. Um, but yeah, that's, it's a process either way though, man. Like you, you can argue who the best is fine. Who the best trio is fine. What, you, what I don't, I, I think you can't really argue though, is the fact that, uh, I, I'm comfortable saying Boise State's going to be top three again next year. I, maybe yeah. even higher than that, but like they're they're going to be top three in the Mountain West preseason, um, no doubt, no and, doubt. And I do want to talk football here. We'll get to that in a yeah. second. But yeah. uh, somebody's asking when the spring game is again. It's April 20th. We'll get to the football talk here in a minute. But we did have three questions, basically asking the same thing about the transfer portal. Mm-hmm. Uh, are we hearing anything behind the scenes? Uh, when are we going to hear anything about the transfer portal? Appreciate Perry BSC Bill for the questions. Uh, they're in a dead period right now. It ends on Thursday, I believe. So I would suspect, Jay, they might have a guy or two in for a visit this weekend. Um, I reported uh, Alvaro Cardenas uh, has visited Boise State. Um, I believe he's the only player that has actually visited is the San Jose State point guard. I know they're interested in some other guys. We've seen some names continue to be associated with them on there. And that's why it is kind of crazy. Like, it's cool they're on the field. It's 68, top 25. It's cool they're in some of these. But, like, if you took a snapshot of every roster right now to what it's going to look like come the first day of practice, yeah. like Boise State could have two or three significant additions. And some of these schools are still going to lose guys because the portal's still open. Like, it's just, you know, I'm all for rankings and all that and clickbait, but it just seems like more than ever with the transfer portal and all that, like 
it's kind of it's kind of silly right now to be doing top 25 for next season. Um, because with that said, we we think Boise State's gonna be pretty good, but part of that is we're kind of banking on them doing what they did last year and getting an mm-hmm. impact player or two in the transfer portal. Um, my understanding is, and you may see it differently, or maybe people you've talked to is differently, Jay, but they're trying to get one starter out of this mix, and whether that's a, a center or a guard, um, they don't really care, and they'll kind of see which way that goes. They want to get the best player they can. Um, they also don't want to wait around, so it's almost the first, you know, they'll strike on the center if that's the guy they can get, and then they'll move everybody up a spot, you know, and Omar will play the four, Tyson the three, Buzo the two, and Roddy the one, is, or, which I or think they'll is get another, man. you know, point guard, shooting guard type and bump everybody down, and then whichever spot they don't get in the starting spot, they still mm-hmm. want to go and get, um, you know, a key spot at the other spot because obviously the two main spots they need is a center and then another kind of playmaking guard. I mean, we've mentioned that before, speculated about that before. If if all of a sudden Buzo winds up at the two, you have Tyson at the three, um, Omar at the four, like all of a sudden, man, you have a really big physical team that you feel can defend just about anybody out there, can out-rebound just about anybody out there. And, um, you know, I, I do go back and I think of that team uh, two years ago with Mulad and Armouche and um abu kijab and yeah yeah tyson dagan hart and marcus shaver totally i get it yeah like but but you know abu was like this extremely good he was he was like a glue guy but he was also your best player which is a hell of a combination right um awesome character awesome leader tougher than hell outstanding basketball player and then you get a lot of those same things you say about Milad and armush he was quiet he was like again. He was almost like the the Dennis Rodman of of the mid nineties, late nineties, right? Like he got out of bed and was like, "Hey, I might get up a couple of shots today, but I'm also going to go get fifteen rebounds and six on the offensive glass, and that's what I'm going to do, right?" And so, um, if they could add a, if it, I mean, we'll we'll see which way which direction they go because they could add that piece, which would be outstanding. They could also add what they thought they were going to try to add last year in Cam Martin in a stretch five that, that really spaces the floor for, for those guys. Um, I can't wait, but e- either way, they, they have the roster flexibility BJ where they can kind of go whatever direction they want with this thing. Again, though, presuming that Buzo comes back. And somebody's asking about Cardenas and Roddy. Um, all I'll say is like, um, you've got to keep recruiting. Like you got to keep trying mm-hmm. to find players. Like if they find someone that's better than Roddy Anderson, and Roddy Anderson gets mad and leaves. Like, I'm not saying that's happening, but like it's college basketball, man. Stuff happens. Like, I think they like Roddy. I think he improved as the season went on, but I do think there's some elements of his game that are not a perfect fit for Boise State's offense. I think anyone has seen that, it's fair to say. Um, if Roddy's the starting point guard next year, I think that's great. That's awesome. But I don't think if you're a coach, if you're not trying to always find better players, I don't think you're doing your job out there. So I don't think it's some better, some huge thing that they're oh my gosh they might they're why are they getting a point guard they don't like Roddy I just think that if you're a coach and you think you can upgrade like you've got to look at that and do that and whether that means Roddy just slides to the two whether that means he gets mad and leaves I don't know um I just think that's every coach in America is always literally trying to find the best players and I think there's a chance they think point guards one of the point guard slash shooting guard is one of the spots they could potentially upgrade at well I, I, everybody's so I mean, th- <clears throat> excuse me, th- this is sports. Like the transfer portal era has, um, it-, it seemed to really heighten the argument of what's unfair and what's fair and all this stuff. And if you feel like you're treated unfair, you get out of here. But you go back, and I-, I don't think it was last, whether it was last night or earlier in the season, uh, Dan Hurley, what he said about how he built the UConn roster. And I thought this was phenomenal. Um, you know, he he listens to the stories and they tell everything, right? So whether he's recruiting a guy and all of us, he's talking to his parents and the, are, are the parents saying, hey, my son needs to do this to get better or is or, or are the parents saying, man, the coach is so unfair. I hate the coach. The coach isn't doing this. The coach isn't doing that. So that that's a tip too because he doesn't want the parents that are just going to complain about the coach. On top of that, he looks at their track record in high school and just kind of growing up. How many times have they have they played for four different high schools? Are they transferring around to play, you know, find minutes or whatever? He he like he looks through all that stuff. He calls himself old school. And so, like, 
the, again, the transfer portal era is like, oh man, the situation is unfair. And let's face it, unfair sometimes just means super darn competitive and it's going to be hard for you to get on a court. Then you run away from that situation. Um, there's nothing wrong with with trying to you know create situations that are more competitive. And that, that's just my, my opinion. And um, I, I do think like, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, but like I've heard the name Cardenas before too, BJ. You're exactly right. And the the guy averaged over five assists per game last year. If you want to go back over the last like five, six seasons of the Leon Rice era, when a player gets five or more assists in a contest, you know, they, they win like 80% of those games to where if they don't, it's more like 55% of the games. So when they have that facilitator, that distributor that makes the whole team better, it, it makes the team better. <laughs> And that's the result, and, and it shows up in wins and winning percentage. So, if you can add a piece like that that you feel like can impact you immediately, then, I mean, I, I just don't, I don't know why you say no at this point. Well, what do you make of David saying they need an athletic seven footer to protect the rim and rebound? Um, that's fine if you can get it. Yeah, if I mean, I, I thought it was kind of cool this year, BJ, that we saw you know two seven footers in the national championship game, and and they were a little bit more of like. I don't want to call them old school because they're they're I mean they're more athletic and and they don't deserve that connotation I guess but um it's just you know we we have seen smaller lineups I guess over the, you know the last few decades for that matter definitely last decade and so it's kind of cool to see the seven footers work their way back into the conversation on really really good teams um don't underestimate Omar Stanley too and what you know he what he does defensively I that that's all I'll say to that one like I feel like he was overlooked at times but um he he can be a rim protector in his own right and another reason man like i mentioned like yeah omar probably played through a little bit of an injury this year but like he was also coached so differently like here than he was at, at st john's like what they asked him to do here versus there like this was a tremendous year of growth and i just can't wait to see him run it back next year and what it looks like because i think he's going to be Matt, like, this is not a not i thought he was awesome this year exceeded all the expectations but like I expect him to make a massive jump again next year. And that's why I think you see like the the basketball junkies over at the field of 68. I, I think that I think they probably recognize stuff like that and and why they think Boise State's a top 25 team next year. No doubt. A lot still to uh, unshuffle here over the next couple of weeks. We expect mm -hmm. a couple additions. Uh, don't expect any departures other than potentially like a Shabuzo Abo. Um, and then, you know, again, I but think again, Omar Stanley, Tyson Degenhart could be very yeah. similar uh, what they do and, and declare and go. And, um, you know, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see on those. But I, I would suspect RJ Keen is, is returning as of now. Yep. I don't think you're expecting any other kind of departures at this point. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. And I, I, I want just one last distinction that I want to make sure we make. If Buzo leaves, it's because he wants to go test his NBA dream. It's not like he's trying to chase something elsewhere. Like he wants to achieve. Oh, his I don't think he would transfer. No, that's what I'm saying, though. Like it's if so. If if he isn't here, it's because he's in a better spot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he's gonna make some good money one day uh, playing this game. And is that day you know this fall or is it next next fall? Like that's just what we'll have to wait and see with him. I want Cardenius, man. I think he fits this offense perfectly. I know he doesn't get much attention because he's at San Jose State, but he yeah, shot almost 40% from three. He was like 13, over 13 points a game. Over You mentioned over five you're, assists. You're, like Whether Roddy back. stays or not, whether they make it work, I, I'm not even saying this is a negative towards <laughs> Roddy. Uh, I think Roddy did some positive things. But if you have a chance to add, my opinion with Stevens leaving and some of these guys leaving, like one of the top two or three point guards in the Mountain West, like mm -hmm. he's the perfect guy for this dude. Team. At, at that point, you're bringing back four starters that averaged 12 points per game in the Mountain West last year. And if you combine their store, scoring totals, like you, those four alone, you're beginning each night at about 60 points. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so in Leon Rice, I think if he gets to 70, he's like damn nearly unbeatable. So, and and also with Cardenas, is he doesn't the turn the ball over. over. Yeah, uh -huh. that's, he's got a he had a great assist to turnover ratio. It was like 2.6 like to one or, one or something. Yeah. I think I looked it yeah. up. I, I mean, he's and, and nothing against Roddy. But that was the thing where he would just drive in once or twice a game. He was good for just a boneheaded turnover. 
And we'll see what happens. I, yeah. I think Roddy's – I'm not giving up on Roddy. I think he's no. going to improve. You talk about yes. Omar having another year. I mean, you give Roddy Anderson another uh, offseason with these coaches to work on his game, I think he could be one of the better point guards in the Mountain West next year too. They're, I just think if you have a chance to go add somebody like a Cardenas, who obviously there must be some mutual interest if he visited already. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I heard he visited Colorado State right after Boise State. So uh. he could be – there's multiple Mountain West schools trying to get him. Um, I just think he – for what this team needs, I think he'd be a perfect fit. So that could be a double victory. Not only do you get him, you keep him away from somebody you have to play, right, BJ? Yes. Um, yeah, and I'm not – yeah, done. man, there, there's not a lot of times where Roddy couldn't get to where he wanted to get to on a court this year. Sometimes he had a little trouble finishing, um, and I feel weird even saying that because I could not do anywhere near close to what he does on a basketball court. But, that was Johnny's um, uh, five – you know, five million dollar move, five cent finish, whatever Johnny likes to say. Yeah, he he just he's got a chance to be really really good, and it, it, we'll see what he can do this off season. No doubt, I, I like Roddy. Good good guy. I was always mm -hmm. nice in interviews. I think he has a chance yeah. to be a really really good player. I just think you want to always try to get as many good players as you can around them. Um, for sure. We'll see what happens. All right, let's talk football for a few minutes. Uh, first, I need to thank a couple of our sponsors real quick. Cutwater Spirits, more than thirty five flavors of pre mixed premium cocktails. Pick one up at your local a gas station or grocery store. Perfect for your next game day tailgate. Our title sponsor, RowPaint.com. Check them out, ROEPaint.com. All your painting needs, interior, exterior of your home, whether it's uh, concrete coatings that are going right now. And we've had both of those done to the Reigns family. They did the concrete coatings and they painted our home. And I highly recommend RowPaint.com. Check them out, ROEPaint. Dot com Idaho Central Credit Union ICCU.com the easiest in mobile e-branch online banking check them out Idaho Central Credit Union their name is all over the uh, local sports arenas around the state and uh, you can find a branch pretty much on every corner so happy and the Reigns family made the switch I just wish we would have done it earlier so Idaho Central Credit Union check them out ICCU.com and there is one final episode coming of the Tyson Degenhart show where there may be an announcement We'll have to wait and see on that in the next week or two. There's going to be a, an announcement on Tyson Degenhardt's future potentially coming on uh, Idaho Central Credit Union's final episode of the Tyson Degenhardt Show. Ridley's Family Markets, shopridleys.com, 14 locations around the state of Idaho. Love that CUNA location. Get down there often. Make sure you check them out. Find a location near you, shopridleys.com. Been working with Matt Bowser. We're putting our house on the market this week, and I can highly recommend Matt Bowser, Kelly Ridley, the whole staff over there at Bowser Real Estate have just been so Great to work with, and we're very appreciative of Bowser Real Estate. So if you're looking to buy or sell a home, there's a reason he's the number one ranked realtor in the Treasure Valley. I've seen the service firsthand, and I highly, highly recommend Bowser Real Estate, BowserRealEstate.com. Lithia Ford of Boise, we're just going to roll through these. Uh, bear with me for a minute, folks, and we'll get to the football talk. Lithia Ford of Boise, LithiaFordBoise.com. Five NIL deals. They're helping the local athletes at Boise State. And again, they're sponsoring the hole-in-one at the golf tournament. So they make it easy. Uh, you go to lithiafordboise.com. You can view their full inventory of vehicles, do the research. Rain's family did that, went in and uh, happily purchased our F-150 from Lithia. So highly uh, recommend the folks there. Jim Sterk and company do a tremendous job. And they're, again, they're a huge supporter of Boise State. So return the favor at lithiafordboise.com. If you need a, a good meal, how about Taco Bell? Check them out and they're hiring. Tacobellworks.com. You can get half your wages the next day after your shift. You can also get free food while you work. So check them out, tacobellworks.com. And again, the SON Management Group, the Nicolason family have been supporting Boise State Athletics for years. They're sponsoring the endowed scholarships for the men's and women's basketball team. So return the favor and go eat at Taco Bell. The Blue and Orange Store, you need some Boise State gear, check them out, theblueandorangestore.com. Free shipping, any order over $40. You can also check out uh, online, the blue and orange store.com. But if you're in the Boise area, just go to the Boise Town Square Mall, the second floor there next to Pro Image. Caps, jerseys, hats, bumper stickers, car flags, you name it. They got it all at the blue and orange store. And if you need a job, transportation compliance service will hire you. Get in the trucking industry, transportation compliance service, all the permits, DOT, overweight, everything you need to get into the trucking industry and get out there towing that first load in no time. They can do it for you at transportation compliance service and Bronco Brew Coffee. Uh, could use an extra cup of that right now as we get ready to head out to practice. Broncobrew.coffee. You're helping Boise State Athletics in the NIL game with every sip. In many cases, fresh roasted to order coffee is at your doorstep in 24 hours. Make sure you check them out at broncobrew.coffee. Leanfeastmeridian.com. Check them out. Dave and his staff, over 10,000 meal combinations. 
leanfeastmeridian.com. You can order online or you can go on in and uh, customize your meals. Fully customizable. It's fresh. It's not frozen. Two minutes in the microwave and you're eating steak, shrimp, uh, all different kinds of options. And they got every diet covered as well, whether it's keto, uh, you know, whatever your diet is, uh, they've got you covered there at Lean Feast Meridian. And Jay, I want to throw in a quick plug for the golf tournament. We only have nine foursomes remaining in the morning. And uh, again, there is a bidding war for Jay Tuss. The highest donation to the Idaho Youth Sports Commission uh, can uh, we'll, we'll just do that, and then Jay can uh, play. And again, you're getting a you're getting a 300 yard drive right down the middle of the fairway every tee shot. Uh, you're getting uh, just immaculate short game around the around the green. Um, you're basically getting a scratch golfer in Jay Tuss when you when you get out there and play. So. Hey. I'm I'm perfectly cool to lie about my golf game if it helps the Idaho Sports Commission. So you're exactly right, BJ. Well, I don't know. Maybe this year Jay Tusk could just be our celebrity shot there on the par three. Uh, the only problem is there's water involved, and and we are trying to limit the number of balls. After uh, Tyson Degenhart cost us about 12 balls last year on hole 17. Um, I don't know, Jay, if that's a good option for you as well or not. <laughs> Definitely not. If Tyson put 12 in, I'd put like a hundred in. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I'll say about RJ hey, Keene. He was hey. our afternoon celebrity shot, and I think if you played yeah. in the afternoon and donated, uh, you got a little closer to the pin than you did on most of Tyson's shots. So hey, real, real quick, too, by the way, we talk about 12. So how many groups are there, BJ? Uh, we're hoping to have around 60 total, 30 in the morning, 30 in the afternoon. Okay, so 60 – or so we'll, we'll go 30, but at four – 240 golfers. At, at – four, at, at four golfers a group though so he puts 12 in out of a about 120 or so shots that's that's not no 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 he gets he took uh 60 shots he took, he 60 took one shots. per group what was it that i thought couldn't you pay for more though maybe some did i think it was one he takes one shot with you as you guys okay. tee off so i think he, i felt uh, like it, i felt i felt like we could pay for more maybe did he get I'm it on when you, did he get it on the green for your uh when you when you when you came by couldn't have knocked it closer really okay yeah I don't know if that was the case, but that's the story I'm going to stand by because Tyson Degenhardt's an outstanding guy. <laughs> they uh, had a tough pin location on hole 17 that day, if I remember they right, did. back up the top of the hill. It was like 100, yeah. 100. And, always love those 180 yard par threes where yeah. you're, using a, you're embarrassed to use a wood of some sort yeah. on a par three. But uh, yep. Well, I don't use a wood on 180. That's that's just ridiculous getting the way you get the wind out there sometimes. It's uh, it, it can be a challenge <laughs> anyway. Looking forward to it. Get in now, it's going to sell out. Jay, Johnny, Prater, the whole crew is going to be out there. And as I've said for the first time, Spencer Danielson will be joining us out. I think that's what needs to happen. The ceremonial first shot is Jay Tuss and Spencer Danielson out on uh, hole one yeah, to start I've, this tournament off. But uh, super be excited to get like Justin Schultz. Super excited to get Spencer involved. It's going to be a lot of fun, and uh, appreciate everybody. We'll have the Degenhardt Dozen Donuts out there again for breakfast. Uh, again, we're giving away the free car with, with uh, Lithia Ford of Boise, and uh, again, you can just hang out with guys like this. Well, what could be better uh, out there on the course than uh, John Mallory and, uh, and Jay Tust out there having a good time on the course? And A lot of former players, coach, is going to be a great time, and again, we're hoping to sell this thing out, raise a lot of money for the Idaho Youth Sports Commission. We gave Five thousand dollars our first year. We gave eight thousand dollars our second year. Jay, we're hoping to get to five figures here. Ten thousand dollars is the goal uh, to give to the Idaho Youth Sports Commission. So uh, we'll have some more football players and stuff out there. I know Jonah Dalmus is already recruiting guys, Jay, to get out there and play. So going to be a lot of fun. Again, BroncoNationNews.com/golf is where you can uh, get it more information. BroncoNationNews.com/golf. Or you can email me, reigns at bronconationnews.com, reigns at bronconationnews.com, and we will uh, get information to you. All right, Jay, these stats are on the screen here from the scrimmage. Uh, Spencer Danielson talked. That uh, interview aired on KTVB is up on ktvb.com. Uh, we've got it on the BNN YouTube channel as well. But uh, I'll kind of siphon through the or cycle through the stats here. Overall, what were your takeaways from what we heard from Spencer Danielson, the stats we saw? from the first scrimmage on Saturday? I think the main thing was is that, yeah, QBs didn't have a pick. Um, I, I see that you say, you know, Ashton Janty and Breezy Dubar didn't play for the running backs. Also throw in there that, um, you know, Maddox Madsen, he's just, he he's not doing 11 on 11 right now, but he's doing everything else that seems right. So with that being said, CJ Teller, Malachi Nelson, and Colt Fulton, uh, you know, they got they got the lion's share of the work, and especially Colt Fulton, 11 of 19 for 108 yards and a touchdown. But Malachi, super efficient, 7 of 10, 73 yards, that touchdown. Uh, CJ Tiller, 
you know, had a big throw in that game that resulted in a touchdown on, uh, you know, late game situation to, to Austin Bolt, I believe it was. Um, so, yeah, was it Austin or was it uh, Prince, PJ? Do you remember that one? I think it was Austin. Uh, I've got that actually right here. There you go. I was wrong. <laughs> Oh, Malachi, yeah, or uh, no, it was, uh, yeah, C.J. Tiller to Prince, 40-yard touchdown pass um, in, a, in a crunch time situation. So, um, yeah, I, 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 we can only take so much from this, right, man? Like, we're not there. We're at the mercy of, you know, people relaying information, which we're grateful for because in past in the past, we didn't even get these types of stats, really. Oh, it's to, way uh, more than we used to get. Yeah, not even, not even close. And so it's nice that we can highlight some players. But I also think you just see, B.J., like, a pretty uh, um, eclectic group of guys. Like there's a lot of people contributing down to Troy Wilkie who had a two yard rushing touchdown, the Rocky mountain uh, uh, walk on. So um, just a lot of guys contributing. Yeah. We heard Jeremiah Irby with a nice pass breakup in the end zone as well. Uh, if you want to look at negatives, I guess the offense only two of 13 on third down, but as, as yeah. Mike Sanford was saying on ball talk the other night, they script a lot of that. So that a lot of that could have been third and long. We don't exactly know the situations. Um, was a lot of that, you know, later in the game, once they had the threes and fours out there, um, you know, kind of tough to look at, but of course, as we expected, Jay, there were several people a little, uh, already questioning the defense for not having inter any interceptions. So, I mean, it's, you can't win in these things. You're either happy the offense didn't have any picks or you're mad the defense, uh, you know, didn't have any or the other way around. And so um, it's a spring scrimmage. I would yep. say what a third, maybe that's a little high, but I mean, a fourth of your roster that or, or I mean, there, there are several key guys on both sides yep. of the ball that are not out there. You mentioned Maddox, Madsen, Genty, Breezy, Dubar, uh, Chris Marshall, Cam Camper, two starting offensive linemen just from your offense on defense. You don't have Ahmed Hassanin or Marco Notriani. Uh, you don't have uh, Shea Oladipo. Um, there's some D linemen, uh, Callahan's out. I mean, there are a lot. I mean, you could, I mean, we've listed mm -hmm. 10 potential starters out of 22 J that are not out there. So it's good that these guys are doing things, but to make any rash, large decisions about last year's problems are, you know, still being a problem after the first spring scrimmage, I, I think it's going a little too far. Yeah. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm just going to be stoked probably about Prince Strawn four catches, 71 yards and a touchdown. Matt Wagner. Oh, you can take positives there. away. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Matt Wagner, four catches, 22 yards, because when you're missing roughly a third of your starting defense, like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to make a prediction, BJ. We're going to be in the, this is going to be the exact opposite storyline next scrimmage. Ah, defense, man, they really bounced back, created a couple turnovers. Like, I, like, I'm, I'm almost, I, it happens, you know, it's never one side of the ball just dominates every scrimmage. It's just watch the defense is going to have, oh man, they had five sacks or, you know, just it's going to happen this next scrimmage, I bet, because it, that's just how it always seems to ebb and flow in these things. Yeah. And it's a different, um, I mean, we've talked about it, but because they pushed back spring practice with uh, mm -hmm. uh, adding, uh, you know, losing the offensive coordinator, Bush Hamden, so close to spring ball yeah. and, and changing it and only having the three practices, typically they'll go two weeks and have that first spring scrimmage that, um, you know, that, that before spring break, right. after kind of five or six practices, then they go, you know, another two weeks essentially or a little bit further before they have that second scrimmage. Um, you're going, you know, back to back scrimmages in a span of seven days. And then you have the spring game the following week. So three straight Saturdays, essentially they're having scrimmages here. Only two practices between scrimmage one and scrimmage two is a little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's an important thing to note because, um, the, you can only practice 15 times in the spring, right? It's not like in season where, you know, you're practicing almost every day in between games, not every day, but almost every day between games. So, um, yeah, it's not like that necessarily. So you really got to make the most of your work and and get after it so you can do better in, in the scrimmage because it, it is only seven days between them. You're right. What's your take on the QB battle? You mentioned Maddox Madsen hasn't been out there. You and I yeah. talked to CJ Tiller, and mm -hmm. I was super impressed. And I think I told you this last week. Um, and I said maybe it was only a 0.1 of 0.1%. But after listening to CJ Tiller, and I guess it was Thursday and talking to him, like I, I – I'm taking him a little more seriously in this competition right now. And I, again, is he probably going to start? Probably not. But it, do I think he's doing enough right now to at least keep this competition going? Um, my untrained eyes watching practice, I think he's improved. And I think he said all the right words. I was very impressed with his mental 
uh, and how he took this. And I know we did touch on this on Thursday, but you see the stat or on Friday, but you see the stats from the first scrimmage. All three quarterbacks that played had a touchdown pass. None had interceptions. That's not even counting what uh, what Maddox Madsen is going to do when he gets back. I mean, I, I I truly think at this point there are three guys that all truly believe they have a chance to win this starting job, and I think all three should should be given a chance at this point. Yeah, um, they're all in. They're they're. I mean, in all honesty, BJ, they're probably all in different. Uh, I don't know if roles is the right way to phrase it, but I'm just going to go with that for now different roles than they'll play this fall right like Maddox isn't playing in 11 on 11 because he's coming back from an injury Malachi Nelson isn't necessarily QB1 right now because he's learning a new offense which is complex right and so you have CJ Tiller who has only been on campus for a year but knows the offense as well as anybody that's left in that room and fully healthy at this moment so he is kind of first in line most of the time as QB1 uh, during spring ball at the moment so I was impressed with CJ and I, I think that we watch a lot and you know, I don't, I'm going to call, I'm not going to call it the best cause I, I, that might be unfair, but he made one of the best throws that I've seen so far at fall camp when he hit Matt louder, um, spring, camp. you know, for that, for that touchdown. Was that, you said fall camp spring, sorry, spring camp. Yeah. Uh, he made one of the best throws of, of this spring camp when he hit Matt louder for that touchdown last week near the front pylon. Like it was a gorgeous 40 a lot of oohs and ahs on that one. Yeah. And so, uh, and it's funny because he said that, you know, when we were talking to CJ, he said Matt made a great catch. And once the interview was over, I was like, QB made a pretty good throw too <laughs> because, you know, he wasn't really going to take credit for it. But man, the, that ball was on the freaking money. So um, reasonable expectations. That's what I'll continue to preach, whether, you know, regardless of what quarterback we're talking about here. But yeah, I was, I was impressed with CJ and he continues to grow. And again, only been on campus for about a year. And, uh, again, they'll practice today. They're practicing right mm-hmm. now. We're going to hurry out there uh, here in a second. And then uh, they'll practice Thursday. Today, after practice, uh, Herbert Gums, Zion Washington, Matt Lauder, Amarian McCoy, and Troy Wilkie uh, will be speaking to the media after practice today. Uh, and then, again, scrimmage two on Saturday. We'll get to talk to Spencer Danielson again after that. Uh, Jay, final question for you. Somebody was asking earlier, I can't find it, if there's any update on Kobe Young and the football team. Uh, not yet. I, I, I don't know if we're going to get that answer it might it might even take till the end of spring ball just because um they're trying to see you know is there a potential scholarship for him will that kind of you know how's that going to factor into kobe's decision so um i have not had one in the last couple of days in terms of an update but i didn't necessarily expect to get one in the last couple of days i did see though uh, someone reported he's going to take a couple of visits for basketball yeah so i those are the decisions that he has to make right now like and I'm assuming he's going to want to be on scholarship. So does if Boise State football has a scholarship, he loves Boise. Like he loves the city. Um he really does, but um that those are the, those are going to be the deciding factors for him and I I'm on board with it too, man. I get it. Yeah. All right, we're going to head over to practice. Yeah. We'll have interviews for you after practice. We'll have uh you know the news tonight, all the various uh newscasts on KTVB. Make sure you're watching Jay and Brady for all their coverage. We'll get the post game or the post practice interviews up on the Bronco Nation News YouTube channel, uh, and then OJ, I wanted to give you a chance to plug real quick. I know we're late already. Uh, I always kind of talk about my kids' baseball games and joke about that and stuff, but I saw the uh, the cutest pictures, man. You had a chance to uh, go dancing over the weekend. Yeah, that, that seemed yeah, like yeah. an awesome uh, so uh, something that I will never get to do. Go mm-hmm. to a uh, they don't have father son dances, so I won't be going to any uh, father son dances. You had a chance with your daughter to to go uh, to uh, the school dance. And I thought that was uh, that was really cool, man. I, I don't know if you're on Facebook much or not, but I, I liked uh, Camille's photos. I thought it was, uh, I thought that was pretty cool, man. It had to be a cool it, moment for you. It was awesome. It was awesome. Um, we usually try to get out for a daddy-daughter night uh, a couple nights a year. Um, doesn't happen anywhere near as frequently as I would like it to, but she's the coolest kid. So daddy-daughter dance at her school on saturday and then her birthday was sunday so it was an awesome weekend in the tust household and real quick bj it was really funny because i didn't necessarily know what to expect out of the daddy daughter dance i was like do we just go there the kids go crazy and i gotta say man there are a number of dads that are very good sports and we're out there on the dance floor and it was also nice to see as i kind of looked around and i'm staring at my future in the face of how long do i get to do this for and um you know there were you know girls that are probably 10 11 and they were still dancing with their dads and that gave me hope that collins will still see me cool enough to take me to a daughter daddy daughter dance not only when she's four but you know maybe when she's a little bit older too so that that 
it gave me a little bit of hope there that I can be cool in her eyes for, you know, maybe another seven or eight years. Yeah, that had to be uh, – They had the photos looked great. It looked like you guys had a great time. That's got to be a cool dad uh, mm-hmm. moment for you and uh, happy for you, man, and the family that you got to experience that. And and uh, we got a baseball game tonight, uh, so we'll see if we can we're, – we, we're undefeated right now, man. We're uh, – we're, we have one win and one tie so far. We have yet to lose <laughs> in our two games early on. So we're uh, – I've told the kids we're undefeated. We got to keep it going, man. Keep it rolling, buddy. Yes, we will see. I have one kid batting third and one kid batting last. So we'll see uh, what happens in the game tonight. (laughs) But um, it's been fun and we'll see. But uh, Jay, appreciate you, man. We'll we'll talk to you again on on Friday and kind of preview what we want to see in that second scrimmage. May have some some updates by then on visitors for the basketball team. I don't Mm -hmm. know. Um, but a lot of good comments in the chat today. We went longer than I expected, but it was good discussion and good good stuff in there. So we appreciate yeah. all you guys. You make the show much easier when you have comments and questions to ask. So keep that coming. We appreciate you guys. And uh, keep supporting us and on social media. Subscribe to the website if you can. And uh, we'd love to have you. And, and uh, that'll do it. We'll wrap it up. We'll see. We'll uh, go to practice. I'll see you over there, Jay. We'll see you after practice with interviews. And then uh, be back tomorrow with uh, Johnny Mallory at 9 a.m. And uh, by the way, big softball game tomorrow. Spencer Danielson throwing out the first pitch. We'll have to compare that to, to Johnny and Prater's first pitch. I don't know if you've thrown out the first pitch yet at a softball game, Jay. Nope. Um, but uh, Spencer Danielson, number nine, number eight, Washington in town under the lights tomorrow. Big softball game. Go support them if you can. Spencer Danielson throwing out the first pitch. So that'll do it. Go subscribe. Tell your friends. We'll talk to you at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day. Bronco Nation News live here at Bronco Nation News.